Daniel chapter 2, verse number 1. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled, and his sleep break from him. Then the king commanded to call all the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dream. So they, his dream. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. If ye will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut into pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. But if ye show the dream and the interpretation thereof, ye shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation of it. The king answered and said, I know of a certainty that ye would gain the time, because ye see the thing is gone from me. But if you will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me, till the time be changed. Therefore, tell me the dream." And I shall know that you can show me the interpretation thereof. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asks such things at any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. And it is a rare thing that the king requireth. And there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this cause, the king was angry and furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain. And they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Let's stop our reading there and let's ask the Lord to bless his word this morning. Our Father, I thank you, Lord, for the text that's before us this morning as we consider this forgotten dream, this dream where he didn't, didn't know what it was but and want, wanted to know what it was and what it meant. I pray, Lord, this morning that as we consider this chapter in the Bible, I ask, Lord, that you'll um, open it up to us. Help us, Lord, to see not just the king, not just Daniel, not just the image that he saw in his dream, but help us, Lord, to see the God of heaven who gave the dream, the God of heaven who is speaking to us in this chapter. Help us, Lord, to take from it the things that you'd have for us today. Pray, Lord, that you'll fill me with the Spirit to preach your word today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. This morning, I'd like to preach a message on the forgotten dream. The forgotten dream. Have you ever had a dream and forgotten it? <laughs> I think everybody has had a dream and forgotten about it. Everybody can relate to this. Who hasn't woken up in the morning knowing that you dreamt something but not recalling what it was that you dreamed? In fact, it happens more often than you realize. Did you know that it, scientists will tell you that you actually dream every night for an average of two hours a night, and you dream four to six dreams per night? And uh, that's a good night's sleep. That's what, how much you dream. And uh, do you remember that last night? I don't remember anything I dreamt last night, but apparently I dreamt for two good solid hours and praise the Lord. <laughs> and uh, there are many theories that people have as to why we dream and all that's fascinating, but that's not the purpose of our time in the Bible this morning. The fact is we all have forgotten dreams and, you know, that's what makes the King's commandment so absurd, isn't it? <laughs> I mean... Uh, the, the, decree, the king's decree is the most absurd decree that anybody has ever heard. I woke up this morning. I, had a, I know I dreamt last night. I don't know what it was. I want you to tell me what I dreamt. I want you to tell me what it meant. And if you can't tell me, I'm going to execute you. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> who, who, who 
acts like that? <laughs> who talks like that? Who would ever make a decree like that? And uh, we could think a minute, a lot this morning about King Nebuchadnezzar and what a strange king he was. <laughs> but I want you to, re to remind you this morning that the Bible isn't a revelation of King Nebuchadnezzar. It's a revelation of the God of heaven. It's a revelation of God. And this morning, as we think of this forgotten dream and what it meant and what Daniel had to say to the king, I want us to see this morning what it tells us about our God in heaven. And uh, this morning, as we look to the God of heaven, what does this passage of scripture have to tell us about him? And what does it, how does it apply to our relationship with him? You think of this forgotten dream this morning, and first of all, it tells us about the greatness of God, the greatness of the God of heaven. Uh, and that ought to put a fear of God in our hearts, you know? When you think of how great God is, it ought to give you a healthy reverence for who he is and what we are. In our passage this morning, we have the greatest king that's in the world at that time, King Nebuchadnezzar. Everywhere this man turns his army, he wins. Everywhere he goes, he, he takes captives. He has set his sights on Jerusalem, the city of God. He has taken captives, taken the vessels from the house of, a God, and, of, of God, and he takes the city and burns Jerusalem to the ground. No king has been able to stand in his way. No gods of men have withstood him. Everywhere he turns, he is feared. Every enemy he faces is cast to the ground. But in the opening verses of this chapter, we find that this king who is feared by all men is shaking in his boots. He wakes up from his dream and he is troubled. His sleep breaks from him. He's unable to close his eyes. He's unable to rest. He is so furious in his anger because of this dream, so trembling because of what he has dreamt the night before. Why? Because the dream was a reminder that he was just a man among men. That he was just man and that God is still the God of heaven, still the king of heaven and earth. Jay White says it was so ordered for reasons that will afterwards appear that Nebuchadnezzar forgot what his dream was, but it was also ordained that he should not forget that he had had a dream of a most wonderful kind. The impression made upon his mind was deep and painful and permanent. He could not forget it. It filled his whole soul. He was so troubled that he could neither compose himself to sleep nor be at rest when awake. Nebuchadnezzar, the great the terrible, the invincible, who had already stormed so many towns, conquered so many countries, routed so many armies, and like the eagle in the tempest, seemed to exult in the storm of battle. Nebuchadnezzar, troubled by a dream. How completely are the greatest of men in the hand of Jehovah. How easily can he make the strongest among them to quail. Listen. God is still God. He's still king. And the greatest of men still quiver in his presence. <laughs> People often say, I want a piece of God. When I see him, I'll, I'll give him a piece of my mind. No, you won't. You'll like Job, you'll abhor yourself and repent with dust and ashes. When you see him in all his glory, you'll be like Isaiah and say, woe is me. For I am a man undone, for I am a man of unclean lips and dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Nebuchadnezzar always thinks that he's in charge. Always thinks that he's the one on the throne. But over and over and over and over again, God tells him, as he tells him in verse 47, of a truth it is, as Nebuchadnezzar testifies, of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings. He's a God of gods and Lord of kings, the king of heaven and earth. And don't forget who he is. Don't forget who you are in his presence and take your place as a worshiper. Take your place as his servant. Take your place before him in humility and acknowledge that the Lord, he is God. 
this text reminds us of the greatness of the God of heaven. Secondly, it, it reminds us of the knowledge of the God of heaven. It reveals the knowledge of the God of heaven. Nebuchadnezzar, right, dreamed a dream, and I don't know what it was. I don't know what it means. He goes to the astrologers, to the Chaldeans, to the soothsayers, tell me the dream. And not one of them is able to reveal the king's secret. Not one of them is able to answer him and say, this is what you dreamt, and this is what, you, what it means. The false gods, the deities that the Babylonians worship, Baal and the Lot, they're not, they're not able to interpret the dream or reveal the secret to the king. But the Bible says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. In our text, there are four young men. Believe it or not, in chapter one, they were children. Chapter two, they're young men. These young men, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, still using those Hebrew names. Those four young men, they have a prayer meeting. They go, and it says in verse number 17, Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. These four young men, they had a prayer meeting. They said, this is a secret. This is something that nobody knows. Nobody knows what was dreamt. Nobody knows what it means. But I know somebody that knows the God of heaven. He knows. It's not a mystery to him. It's not a secret to him. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows the secret things that are hidden in the earth. He knows all things. There is no searching of his understanding. And if we just get down on our knees and look to him in prayer, he will direct our steps. He will guide our path. He will give us the light that we need. He will teach us what we need to know. Friend, do you know it's still the same today? There are lots of things I don't know about tomorrow. <laughs> lots of things I don't know about life. Lots of questions. Lots of things that we wonder about. But I have a God who knows. I have a God who knows the end from the beginning. He knows what's going to happen tomorrow. He knows what's going to happen at the end of the day. He knows everything. And when there's some wisdom I need, some counsel that I need, I can still seek his face. I can still go to God in prayer. I can still look to his word. He still reveals the secret things. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy steps. Friend, are you looking to him? You have a God who cares for you and has infinite wisdom. No searching of his understanding. And when there's something you need to know, you need to know what step to take. You need to know something that has you up at night, something that you're worried about, something that you're troubled about. Don't be shy. Don't be afraid to take it to the Lord in prayer. He wants to help you. He wants to show you his thoughts, show you his words, show you his plan, show you what to do. And he'll give you the peace that passes all understanding. They sought mercies, it says, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning the secret. And verse 19 says, Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O God of thou God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might and has made known unto me now what we desired of thee. For thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. Trust in the Lord. He's the revealer of secrets. He will not lead you wrong. He will not lead you astray. We have his greatness and we have his knowledge. And thirdly, this morning, we have his sovereignty. What does this passage of scripture tell us about the greatness of God, about the God of heaven? 
tells us his greatness, tells us his knowledge, and it tells us that he is in control, tells us the sovereignty. This forgotten dream ultimately reveals that God is the one on the throne of the universe. He's the one who raises up kings and putteth them down. He is the one behind the scenes orchestrating the events as it pleases him. You know, we get so caught up in the fact that the devil is the prince of the power of the air, don't we? We get so caught up. We see how the devil offered to our Savior the kingdoms of this world, and, and we recognize that they were his to give. And we're so often reminded, we can't help but notice the devil's influence, the devil's control, the devil's sway on the hearts of men, the hearts of political figures, the hearts of regular people. We can't, we, we, we can't help but notice the devil's influence in the world. But do we forget that God is still the one overall? Do we forget that he's still the one that's organizing history to lead us to one great event, the return of our Lord Jesus Christ? God has not abdicated the throne. In our text this morning, we have Nebuchadnezzar's dream told for us. Daniel, the God has given Daniel the interpretation, and he starts to tell us in verse number 27, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king and Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed what should come to pass hereafter. And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king, that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image, the great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee. And the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces." Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken into pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. The dream, what's this dream telling us? The image, the gold, the silver, the brass, the iron, the, uh, the iron part, iron part clay is telling us of five kingdoms, five worldwide kingdoms that would rule the world. It started in the text. I can imagine De Nebuchadnezzar as he hears the interpretation. I saw a great image, a glorious, a, a terrible image, the heads of gold. And he says to Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head. <laughs> I'm feeling pretty good about myself. The head of gold. And the prophecy is that Babylon would be the first of these mighty kingdoms in the world, the first of these worldwide empires that we see throughout history. And Babylon was the head of gold, precious. It was typified by their golden city, Babylonia. It was a precious stone. Gold's the most precious in quality out of all these kingdoms here. It was this, you know, Babylon's the site of the famed Tower of Babel. It was a Babel, Nimrod founded after the flood, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And after Babylon, there was no earthly kingdom that measured up to it in glory. But the reign of Babylon was only for 70 years. Daniel tells us that after him would come the silver. And Daniel chapter 5 tells the story of how one night Belshazzar, the grandson of King Nebuchadnezzar, he saw the handwriting on the wall. And his kingdom was given to the breast and the arms of silver, the Medes and the Persians. Daniel tells us in the text, Thou, O king, in verse 37, art a king of kings, for God hath given thee, the, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, 
power and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee rule over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall rise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another king, third kingdom of brass, which shall bear a rule over all the earth. The second kingdom is the Medo-Persian Empire. They are the silver. Uh, the Persians with, um, with the Xerxes and with Cyrus and the different ones. And they, their kingdom was silver, not as precious, inferior to the gold. But that lasted a longer time, 206 years. Then after them, there was the, the brass, the belly and thighs of brass. Speaking of the Grecian Empire, Alexander the Great conquered the Persians in 333 BC. And it makes sense that they were the empire of brass because they were famous for their brazen armor. And Alexander the Great, Great conquered the world quickly, the young age of 33. And then he wept that there was no more worlds to conquer. He was unsatisfied with his success. He died a drunk. His empire was divided. And then in 146 BC, it succumbed to the legs of iron. There's the gold is the, net, is the Babylonians. The silver is the Medo-Persians. The brass is the Grecians. And the iron is the Romans. Iron is the least precious of the metals, you know. Gold and the Olympics. Those are the first three. Gold is um, the one that's first place. Silver is second place. Brass in the Bible is the same as bronze, really. It's a, basically the same metal. Bronze is third place. But whoever competes for an iron medal, <laughs> who would want that as their trophy? but iron was the strongest. Iron's the least precious, but it's the strongest. And the Roman Empire, of course, was the strongest in power. It says in the text that the fourth kingdom, verse 40, shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And the Roman Empire ruled with a rod of iron, you'd say, as they oppressed the world and they lasted, their kingdom lasted all the way to the fall of Constantinople in 1453 AD. But God saw it all ahead of time. God knew it ahead of time. He was the one. The question is, why, why is it that the, the next kingdom is the iron and the clay, and that's going to happen in the tribulation period with the iron and the clay mixing together with the 10 toes. But people ask, well, why hasn't there been a, why didn't Daniel see the other kingdoms of the world that we've seen since the fall of the Roman Empire? Why didn't he see England? Or why didn't he see uh, all these other countries that had great empires? I mean, the sun never set on the British Empire. Yes, but the Brits never did conquer France, did they? They never did conquer the other countries around them. And on top of that, I believe that the prophets had a blind spot. A blind spot. The prophets, they saw two mountaintops. They saw the mountaintop of Christ's first coming and the mountaintop of his second coming. And so they see the church age was a bit of a mystery to them. And so the prophecy sees the Romans in the time of Christ, and then it picks up with the tribulation period, right before the second coming of our Savior, right before, right after the rapture, right before our Lord comes to the Mount of Olives. But all of this, God saw it ahead of time. The Bible gives us the history written in advance. You know, this is something we're going to see a lot in Daniel, is that he wrote of things that in our day, they've already happened. But in his days, they were still future. The critics will love to, criticize, love to be skeptical of Daniel because they say, nobody could be that accurate. Nobody could see all this ahead of time, exactly what Daniel wrote. No, God can. Daniel can't, you're right, but God can. God saw it all in advance. You read Daniel chapter 11 and read of all the detail of the Grecian empire that Daniel foresaw. You're just amazed at how accurate the Bible is as it was history written in advance. But all of these demonstrate to us that God is the one on the throne. Nothing has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God. Nothing has ever caught him by surprise. Nothing has ever caught him 
off guard. He's always foreseen it all ahead of time. And we can rest in that. We can rest in the fact that God is on the throne. I look at these kingdoms and I think, man alive, I don't think I'd want to be alive during the Grecian Empire when Antiochus Epiphanes set up that abomination of desolation in the temple. I don't think I'd want to be alive when Babylon went all throughout the world conquering every kingdom in its state. I don't think I'd want to be alive in the time of the Romans. Except don't you realize that in all of these times, God had his people and God took care of them. And every single time. And Babylon, the head of gold, the king's right-hand man ends up being Daniel. Daniel, the Jewish prince, is there at the right hand of the king. He tries to throw him in the, the he tries to throw his friends in the fiery furnace to no avail, because God is with them, protecting his people. In the Persian Empire, the kings that the kings actually looked, took care of the God's people. They sent for them to have the temple rebuilt, to have Jerusalem rebuilt. The king had Nehemiah at his right hand. Ezra was a friend of the king. Daniel was a friend of the king at the beginning. And ultimately, the king married Esther at the end of that empire. Then there was the Grecians. God in the Grecian time, he, he, he ultimately was preparing the world for the gospel to go all over the world as the world learned Greek. And then guess what language the New Testament was written in? It was written in Greek because God was using that to get the gospel out. The Grecian at times, it, it's not in our Bible, but you can read about the Maccabees and how God miraculously provided for his people even then during their reign. And then I say, well, okay, those three, but I definitely wouldn't want to be alive during the Roman Empire. Except don't you know that that's when the church was planted, was started? Don't you know that it was during the Roman Empire when it was at its strongest that God did his best? That's when Jesus Christ came to this world, died on the cross. That's when the Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost. And those 12 witnesses went into all the world, the Roman world at that time. And they turned the world upside down. Caesar thought he was on the throne but God was still over all. And today it might be easy to think, oh, the world is having its way. The devil is having his way today. He's having a heyday, throwing haymakers left and right. God's still on the throne. He still takes care of his own. You can still rest in the arms of God. You can still, like Ruth, come to trust underneath his sheltering wings. Don't lose faith in the night. Remember that God is still sovereign. This dream tells us about the greatness of God, teaching us to fear him, tells us of his knowledge, teaching us to seek him, teaches of his sovereignty, telling us to trust him. And then there's number four, one of the most exciting ones. It tells us of his coming, telling us to look for him. All these kingdoms, there's ultimately the last one is during the tribulation period with the 10 toes. These kingdoms that he saw this great image, this Terrible image, fearful to behold. And then there's a stone, a rock hewn out of the mountain. A stone, the stone that the builders rejected. The stone comes and smites the image. And it all comes crashing down. It all tumbles to the ground and the stone grows until it fills the whole world. What's it telling us about? It's telling us about the kingdom of Christ, telling us of the day when he will set up his kingdom and reign forevermore. These kingdoms, they conquered the world. They conquered the world of men. They overthrew empires. They won great battles. They overcame great foes. And yet all of them flee at the presence of Christ. All of them will be consumed when he comes in the power of his glory. And it will be shouted, hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Don't you know that he's coming again? You don't need to lose hope in a dark night. You can just look up. Look to the skies. Jesus is coming. Our blessed hope is that he's coming again to this world. <laughs> First, he'll come at the rapture for his saints. And then he'll come at the time of the kingdom. And Daniel was living in Babylon for the first time in history. There was no king in Jerusalem. 
The powers of this world were taking over. It seemed that all was for naught. Holy living was for naught. He worshiped God in the temple for naught. What was the point of it all? But God gave him the promise that he was still on the winning side. And one day God would set up his kingdom once and for all. It's the same for us today. James in James chapter 5 is talking to people that are hurting, people that are struggling, people that are being oppressed. And he says to them, be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Just another few moments. Look for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Are you looking for him? This forgotten dream ultimately points us to the coming of Christ. We see his greatness, his knowledge, his sovereignty, and his coming. But there's one more truth I want you to draw from this text. What does it tell us about the God of heaven? It tells us his worth. It tells us the worth, the value of the God of heaven. Nebuchadnezzar is in this kingdom of gold, and he, he's got everything he wants, doesn't he? He looks at Babylon with its beautiful gardens, with all the gold everywhere in the street, everywhere in the town. He thinks that he has all the riches of this world. And then the Medes come and they take it all away. <laughs> all these kingdoms, they, they feel that they're so important, that they have it all, that they're the that, that they have all the all the riches that man can claim, and that this is what it's all about. Except as Alexander the Great found, the riches of this world, they don't really satisfy. Alexander the Great wept because there was no kingdoms left to conquer. Nebuchadnezzar's grandson and Drak and Reveille over lost it all. All these kingdoms, they came and they left. They rose and they fell. They had their time in the sun and now they, they're gone down in history. But for what? There are no eternal rewards for the armies of Julius Caesar. There is nothing left to show for the splendor of Babylon. It's been destroyed, never to be rebuilt again. And the ruins of it are still there. And you ask, what's the point of it all? It's vain. It's empty. It's worthless. There's no value to it. But in our text, the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of our God, is the kingdom that lasts forever. It appears as a rock, as a stone, not this image of gold, not this thing that earthly eyes look to and say, wow, what? look at that. As it says of Christ in the Bible, there is no beauty that we should desire of him. It looks ordinary to man, but give it time and it will grow. The mustard seed was planted. It will grow in the kingdom of our God. And the kingdom of his Christ will be as far as the east is from the west. And the question will be, not how much gold and silver did I accumulate, not how great the time in the sun was for, a, for Canada or the United States or the different countries of this world, but the question will be, what have I done for the kingdom of God? What have I done for him? All these things. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and he forgot the dream. You know, I think that this dream in the text, I think a lot of people are forgetting it today, aren't they? They're looking around and they're thinking, this is it. This is the world. This is, this is, this is men's, men are on the throne. Men are in control. But they've forgotten that God is still on the throne. He's still calling the shots. He's still working out his plan in this world. And let's not forget to have a healthy fear of him, because one day we'll stand before his judgment seat. Let's not remember to seek his face through prayer. Let's not forget to seek his face through prayer, because you can trust his plan. And let's live for him. Let's look for him. And let's have the right perspective on life. You know, what kingdom are you in? There are kingdoms in this world. There are lots of kingdoms. <coughs> But there's one kingdom that's a lot more important, isn't there? What, what, what country are you a citizen of? It's, it's, I, I don't know. If I was a, a Greek, I'd be proud to have been, a, to have been a, from the country of Alexander the Great. I always bug my stepdad or 
tease my stepdad, Laurent, about Napoleon. He loves Napoleon, you know, he's French and the French are proud of their Napoleon. All these different nationalities are proud of the heroes of the past. And we claim our, the kingdoms of this world. Don't you realize that there's a far greater kingdom that we're part of? Don't you realize that Christ is the king of all the earth? Are you in his kingdom? The fact is, the kingdom, you see in the text that the rock, it, in, the, in the dream, it, it smites the image. And the iron and the clay, they, they fall together and break, breaks them in pieces. And the stone in verse number 35 that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. In the beginning, it was just a stone, but then it grew to a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Our Savior started his kingdom when he preached the gospel of the kingdom and started redeeming souls from fallen men. He's been conquering the world one soul at a time. He said, the kingdom of God is within you. And for those of us who have put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, Colossians 1.13 says that God has delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And if you're perplexed by the nations, remember, you don't have to be a citizen here. You can have your citizenship in heaven when you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Have you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? Our Father, thank you, Lord, for the time we've had in your word this morning. Lord, we're thankful for the kingdom of heaven. Thankful that we don't have to worry about the kingdoms of this world. We don't need to be afraid of what they're doing or what their plots are, what their schemes are, because we serve the God of heaven. And Lord, we know you're on the throne today. We know that you're in control. And I pray, Lord, that we'll just rest in you, that we'll have faith in you, that we'll trust in you. Because we know, Lord, that all throughout history, you have always taken care of your children. Lord, we know you'll take care of us today. Pray that you'll help us to trust you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.